All right. How you doing today? Nice job on the SLP presentations yesterday. Cool projects. Lots of good progress. And definitely excited to see where these projects go over the next couple of quarters. Um, but I think there's some really cool ideas out there. And, um, so what did you think about the expo? Any reflections? Yeah. It needs water bottles. Needs water bottles. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. Uh, you can pass in your extra credit sheets if you got them. Yeah. Um, I know this would be kind of hard to figure out how to do, but it would be nice if there was some way to kind of organize more, like some students getting to get up and go see other tables. Mm -hmm. like, I found I, I think I was able to visit like three other tables. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, there were a lot of people. Yeah, it's hard, especially if you're in a group by yourself. If you mm -hmm. if you're working with somebody else, you can kind of take turns. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if everybody's up walking around and nobody's there to sign, so it, it can it can be a little tricky. Um, but um, but there's there's some wiggle room in in getting signatures too. So thanks. Uh, can you put your name on it? Oh, that would be helpful. Uh, I know who you are. But, um, yeah, so I only saw a few people. Um, Doing the uh, the cocktail party version of the extra credit sheets, and so that's good. Um, I appreciate people staying at their tables. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? All right. So um, if if you were there yesterday and you got a zero on the presentation, it probably means you didn't sign in. So shoot me an email and let me know that you were there, because um, I already found a few people who didn't sign in, but I saw them, so I signed in for them. Um, other than that, so hopefully. Um, your project is at a point where you, you feel like you know what the next steps are, right? And if, if you're continuing with the CS sequence, um, you know, there's an SLP component in 222, and then there's an SLP piece in 223. Kind of the same thing, um, so it's part of your grade. Um, and you don't need to turn in proposals since you've already, you know, started the project, but. Um, you know, there's a poster upload at the end and then a presentation last Tuesday of the quarter for winter and spring. Um, so hopefully your, your projects are at a point where, you know, you know where to go next and you can keep making progress on it. Um, and if, you've, if you're feeling like you need to course correct, right, let me know. Because um, you really want this project to be something you care about. And sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm really excited about such and such in September, and by December it's like, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> so, so if if you're not feeling, you know, thrilled about the idea of working on your project for another two quarters, um, let's talk about it and let's let's figure out something that you can sink your teeth into, because it's fun to have like projects you can actually like be excited about. All right, well, um, I'm going to spend tomorrow and Friday probably talking about review, um, and you can certainly ask questions then or, you know, now. Um, but I wanted to, to wrap up on some material today um, related to processes and some other things that, that, um, that I just kind of wanted to go back and touch on. Um, and these won't show up on the exam because they're kind of last minute, but they're things I want you to, to know about. Um, the first is, is the topic of links. And I somehow skipped over this in the, the course of the quarter. Um, so you know we've got we've got files. And we know about files, and, and so I'm just sitting in an empty directory here, and I can make a new file. Um, 
and there's a file called new file. It's six bytes long, all right, because it says hello and it's got a new line. Um, and I can make a new file called file2 by just copying new file to file2. And now I've got two files. Um, and sometimes it's nice to be able to have a file that actually refers to another file as opposed to being a copy of it. Um, so let's let's see if I can hop on the Linux server. I can. So there's there's this war and peace file under slash temp and it's it's three megabytes. And I want to work with this in developing my, my PA4 so I can say copy slash temp slash war and peace to my current directory period. And now in my current directory I have a file called war and peace and it's three megabytes. Um, and that's fine, but it's a three megabyte file, right? It's taking up disk space. Um, <coughs> there's a different way that I can have a file, a copy of War and Peace in my own directory, and that's to make what's called a link. To basically create something in my directory which points to slash temp slash War and Peace. So let me get rid of this version. So I don't have a war and peace. Here's a command link dash s slash temp slash war and peace. Um, I'll just call it w and p. And now in my directory I have a file called w and p, and it's got this little arrow here saying this is pointing to um, to war and peace. And so if I, you know, more WNP, I'm looking at this file of War and Peace. But it's not actually taking up three megabytes of space in my directory. It's taking up 20 bytes of space, and it's referring to this other file. Okay, why do we want to do this? So let me get rid of new file. Let me get rid of file two. So I've got new file. Okay, suppose instead of making a copy of this into file do two, I do this ln dash s. <coughs> here's the file that I want to copy. Um, and here's what I want to call it. I'm going to call it my copy. Okay, so I can cat my copy, it's got the word hello in it. Suppose somebody comes along and edits new file. Alright, so they make it say new say hello eleven times. If I look at my file, my copy, it's got those changes in it. Right? Now if I had simply copied new file to my copy and then I change new file, my copy doesn't change because it's a separate file. When you do a link like this, ln-s, um, my copy is pointing to a new file. It's like a shortcut in Windows. So any change in new file makes the corresponding change in my copy. And if somebody gets rid of new file, and then I try to cat my copy, it says no such file or directory. Now my copy is still there, it's still referring to new file, but new file doesn't exist. And if I recreate new file, and then I cut out my copy, it's whatever new file is. And I can link to things in different directories. Right, like I did with linking to slash temp slash war and peace. Um, so this is useful sometimes. Um, it's useful if you have one file that you want different people to have access to and be able to do things with without having them put in the entire path to that file. Right, so if you're doing collaborative development and you're making an include file.h, um, 
and other people want to use that, they could always say, you know, number sign includes slash home slash my partner's name slash their 224 directory slash PA5 slash file.h, right? But you could also just create a link in your directory and link file.h to slash home slash my partner's name slash blah, blah, blah. And now you just include file.h and it's referring to crazy path slash file.h. And then if they make changes to their file, when you include your file.h to link to it, you've got those changes, right? It's really just, just referring to another file. And so if I remove my copy, that doesn't affect anything, right? New file is still there. I just removed something that was referring to it. Right, but I can create something that points to it. I can have multiple things that point to it. It, so, so new file is just a plain old file. These things are just references to it. So, for example, if I if I were to edit link two, right, and make some changes in here, those changes appear in new file. Those changes appear in my copy again. Those changes appear in link two, right, because. Link two and my copy again are really just referring to this one file called new file. The only thing that's slightly inconsistent perhaps is if I remove link two, it doesn't remove new file. It removes the link itself. But if I edit link two, it edits new file. If I edit new file, it effectively edits link two. Austin. Yeah. How does does this interact at all with like Git? Um, it could. It's totally up to you, mm -hmm. right? So, so this is purely on my local file system, um, but you can use it with anything. But there's nothing particular about Git going on here. Like if you were to Git commit the, the oh a link file to to Git. That's interesting. To copy it back. I've never tried that. Yeah, I guess it does. Um, I didn't remove it the right way. But yeah, I can check out link two and it's still listed as a link. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, is there a way to force, because I think, you know, like, you can see it uh, earlier, there was the link that was 20 bytes, I think, for warranties. Is there, is there a way to, like, force BI to open the link file instead of the file it's linking to? There may be a switch or something for that, but I don't know. Okay. Um, but in Bash, you can make queries on files. And there should be a query that tells you if something is a link, and if it is, forces you. But, but, well, but I mean, if if I if I vi link to, right, I am editing new file, right. If I vi the thing in my home directory, I was editing slash temp slash war and peace, right. It 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 really is referring to it. Um, and if, if you make a link to War and Peace in your directory and you try to edit it, it'll tell you read only file, right? Because you're referring to slash temp slash War and Peace, which is read only for you. So links are, are a little bizarre sometimes um, when we start messing with them, but they're, they're very useful. Um, When I say vi on my system, I'm executing slash user slash bin vi because that's the place where vi appears in my path. But if I actually look at user bin vi, it's really a link to etc alternatives vi.
And DTC Alternatives VI is really a link to user bin vim.basic. Right? Why? Because maybe the system administrator decides that people on the system should be using a different version of VI. And now they can just change this link to point to user bin slash vim.advanced or whatever. Or maybe they can change this link up here. Right? But but the user just says VI or user bin VI and it can refer to any version of VI that, that you like. Right, same with user bin Java. User bin Java is really a link to ETC Alternatives Java. And so when Java 15 comes out, you don't force people to suddenly say Java 15. They just say Java, but you change what it points to and you have it point <coughs> to the newest version of Java. Right, so right now my ETC alternative is Java points to the open version of Java 11, 64-bit. Um, but if I want to change what Java points to, I can just change that one link, and all my code that uses Java inside Bash scripts and stuff will now be referring to a different version of Java. So that's useful. So, so we've been doing ln-s, and the name of an original file, and then a new file. And this is called a symbolic link. And mostly we do symbolic links. And it means that this is basically, this new is basically a pointer. Not a C pointer, but you know, a reference to some original file. Um, what would a hard link be? We're going to do hard links in a minute. <laughs> um, symbolic links really are just storing the name of this file that we're referring to inside this new file. Um, which is why when you do an ls, right, you just see this arrow going to etc alternatives. And if this file changes, then we point to the changed file. If this file disappears, then we'll get no such file when we say vi in this case. Um, and because they're symbolic, we can have, you know, slash name of flash drive slash blah, 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 right? And I can pop a flash drive in, and I can refer to files on that flash drive because I'm just referring to them by their name. Um, flash drive on me. Um, so, so my main backup drive at home right, is called backup. When I pop it in, it shows up as a slash backup. That's just a link to the formal name of that particular device. When I pop my flash drive in, it's flash backup. And that's a link to that particular device. Um, all right, so those are symbolic. Um, the alternative, and that's what the dash S is. It's a switch which says make it a symbolic link. If we don't do that, this is called a hard link. All right, so um, anatomy of a file system. We have a directory. We have a file called dot sitting in this directory. Dot is your current directory, okay? It's also a file. It contains information about what's in this directory. So it has to have the name of the files in here. It has to know about or be able to get to, you know, who owns them, their permission bits, things like that. Um, but it also needs a way to actually get to the contents of the file. 
Okay, and the directory itself, this dot file, does not contain the contents of the files. It just contains header information about the files. The files themselves are stored somewhere else because these files can be big. Right, and I can put war and peace in here and my directory file is not going to be three megabytes. Okay, it's just going to be big enough to say there's a file called war and peace. So it has to contain information about where these files are actually stored physically. So if we do an ls-i, we get this number in the beginning. This is called the inode number. So an inode is, is basically a reference to some sort of structure that tells you where these files are actually stored. And so my new file down here at the bottom has an inode number of 9311341. If I were to look at my hard drive in the right way, I could use that number to find where on my physical hard drive the actual contents of that file are stored. And that's basically an index into something like a huge array that contains file names and locations on disk and how big they are and permissions and all sorts of other information. In an operating system course, you might take that structure apart and actually figure out where that points to on your drive. Um, so, so quick refresh, right? Hard drives, even if you have a solid state drive, it kind of acts like this, right? So hard drive is a piece of metal covered with a coating that lets you adjust magnetic charges at different spots on it, right? And if it's a 16 terabyte hard drive, it has 16 trillion times eight individual locations that you can set the polarization on, right? It's mind boggling. Um, and so you have these, these platters, and they spin in some direction. And they don't spin that fast, right? 7,200 times a minute, maybe. So 120 revolutions per second. Um, not that fast. And there's a mechanism here called a read-write head. And it can move forward and backwards. And somewhere, there's a little strip of magnetic material that you're interested in reading the polarizations of. And so this disk is spinning. This piece of material periodically comes over here where the read-write head is. So you move this head in so that it's on what we call the cylinder. Right, so it's in exactly far enough that this piece of material we're interested in is going to move underneath the part of the head that picks up uh, the magnetic recorded information and you wait for this to spin to the point where this is underneath and now you start reading the signals coming from that read right head that says you know north north south north south 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 north basically so these these pie slices are called sectors this sort of imaginary circle of things across all sectors is called a cylinder. And so we do a seek where the read write head moves into the appropriate cylinder and we wait for this, this spinning action to bring our sector under the read write head and then we start reading in data or writing data. Right? Um, so something needs to code where this piece of information is stored on the hard drive. And that coding is basically, um, you know, usually what sector you're in, what cylinder you're in, which is how far you are towards the center, um, and how far along this, this sector your data begins. Right? And it's, you know, terabyte drive, it's a trillion locations that you need to address, so it's broken up. And sometimes you have multiple platters, right? So you might have eight platters, um, and they might have a top and a bottom, right, to get more density. Um, and you'd have eight read-write heads that move together, 
and you just pick whichever platter you want to read off of, right? Um, and there's tons of, of theory behind how you architect a hard drive like this to make it efficient. Um, and usually the sectors are staggered because we can't just read data endlessly from a hard drive. As we're reading it, at some point we need to do some processing with it. And then we can go ahead and read some more. So you usually stagger these sectors so that um, I wrote them backwards. But um, so if, if we're starting to read data, we can consume data from sector one. And then we can process it. And while we're processing it, these other sectors are spinning under the read write head. And then when we're ready for sector two, sector two is under the read write head. Whereas if we had sector two right here, we might not be ready to process that. And we'd have to wait for the disk to spin all the way around again. So there's stagger patterns in there. And this stuff is like, adjustable to some degree and different manufacturers do different things and this has evolved over time and it's a whole lot that goes into it and we get to completely ignore it right we just say f open f gets f print f f close and all this happens right it's happening because of the operating system because somewhere there's low level routines that are calling lower level routines that are calling hardware um, commands that are dealing with all of those realities and we mostly get to ignore them um, but we can we can tap into them a little bit when we start looking at things like inode numbers right because that's that's the starting point that will eventually lead us to you know knowing where something actually is physically on a drive okay so what is a hard link um, so I've got link two, I've got my copy again. They're both soft links or symbolic links to new file and they have different inode numbers. Um, so let me get rid of those. So I've just got my new file. Okay, let me do a non-symbolic link. Link, um, link two to new file. Um, it's the current one and then the thing that you're creating. So let's link new file to my copy again. Well, now I've got three files. They don't have the little arrows pointing out as symbolic links, but they all have exactly the same inode number. These three names linked to my copy again and new file are effectively the same file. Right? Why? Because when the system tries to open the file or look at the file or write the file, it starts with the inode number. And all three of these things refer to the same location in the data structures that refer to this file. They're all going to go to the same spot on the physical drive. And now if I were to remove new file, <coughs> right, these files are still here and they still very much exist. All right, so now I got five files and they're all the same file. And if I edit one and then I look at another, it's going to be the same. Why? Because they're actually the same file. This is very zen. This is, this is very non-dualistic, right? We can't even really talk about five files here. We have one file. We're just referring to it by five different things. But they're all exactly the same file. So I am he and you are he, and et cetera. Yeah? Can you give an example of how you can use it? You can use it just like a symbolic link, OK? So how do you decide which one? Well, so, so a disadvantage of this is that you cannot go across different devices, right? My directory is sitting on a particular physical device or a virtual physical device. Um, and if I wanted to refer to a device on a flash, a file on a flash drive, right, I can't do it with this 
because there's a totally separate set of inode numbers and a separate file structure associated with my flash drive. Or if I have two hard drives, I can't put a link in one hard drive that refers to another one as a hard link. So I would use symbolic links there. Um, but the advantage is all five of these files are, are equal. There is no one source file that the others are referring to. In the case of symbolic links, right, the only real file was new file. In my copy, again, in link two were just references to that. And if new file got deleted, those references would say no such file. Down here, there really is no which is the real file. They're all just references to inode 9311341. That's the only real file. And so no one of these has any special distinction. Um, and so if you really just want multiple <coughs> local references to a single file, you would use a hard link. But for some reason, hard links have kind of fallen out of favor. I don't know why. Yeah? Um, if you move a, a file to a different directory, will it keep the same inode? inode? Yes. So, so that's the other thing. Um, Right, so now I'm in, I'm in my home directory, and link2 is a file up here. But it's still referring to inode 9311341. One. Now, if I had a symbolic link, and then I, I took the thing that other files were pointing to, and I moved that, those symbolic links would break. Right, it would say, well, there's no such file as that anymore. Here, these are really just, just different names for that same, that same inode number. All right, here's the other thing. Symbolic links, right? If you delete the file that things are referring to and then you try to look at the symbolic link, it says no such file. Well, I've got four files here that all refer to the same inode. If I remove one of them, right, I can still look at the file through any of the other three. So remove is a little more interesting than we normally say. Normally we say when you say rm file it deletes the file. Well that's not exactly what it does. When you say rm file what it really does is reduces the count of how many things are referring to that inode. Okay it gets rid of this thing called aa and it remembers that now there's only three things pointing to this inode. But the contents of that file are still on disk. They haven't been been touched. Yeah? Does it matter to the system which one is the first original? Nope. It makes no difference, which is another difference from a symbolic link. Symbolic link, you have a notion of the true file and other things are pointing to it. A hard link, you just have this stuff on disk and different things are referring to it. So theoretically, you could have one file and delete it, and that data is still on the hard drive, right? You can mm -hmm. read that off the hard drive. You have some little way to get that off. Actually, so, so that's you only have one file and you remove it. You can actually change what's on the hard drive, right? So yeah. So that's that's a slightly slightly deeper issue. Um, when we have three things with the same inode, we can delete one of them, and the other two will still refer to it, right? So, so the data is not lost by the remo remove command. The remove command simply decreases how many things are referring to it. So when I remove AA. In my directory, this thing called AA is, is no longer appearing, right? But the contents of the file, which was, you know, that inode is still there. And if I remove my copy again, I can still cat AAA, right? But now the system knows there's only one file out there that's referring to this inode. So if I remove this file called AAA, now it knows there's nothing referring to that inode. Now it considers that to be deleted. Okay, but what does that actually do? It says inode 9311341 is available. If somebody needs space and that inode works for you, you can use it. 
But in general, it does not actually remove the contents from that old inode from the hard drive. All it's doing is saying we're not pointing to that inode anymore. But chances are the data in there, here I am again 11 times, is still written on the hard drive. And if you knew that it was inode 9311341, you could probably go back in and figure out where that was written on the physical hard drive and you could still read that information. And if you don't know what the inode was, you can go through and you can look for entries in this structure that points to files and find things that have been deleted and see what is stored where they were pointing and you can probably find this file that was deleted. So you can have undelete utilities, right? And that's basically what they're doing because usually when you say remove a file, it doesn't actually get rid of the contents from the hard drive, right? Just like when, when you have a variable that you haven't initialized, it still has a value. There's, there's no such thing in most computers of like a non-value, right? I is always equal to something. It just may not be zero unless you set it equal to zero. Well, every sector of the disk has something stored on it. Every piece of your hard drive has a value written. Um, it may be random, it may be initialized to be empty, or it may be whatever was there the last time that you wrote something. Now, if you use a shredder, I don't know if I have a shredder. So um, on Linux, you can use the shred command instead of the remove command. <coughs> and when you shred, it will um, not only remove the reference to the inode, but it will first go into those locations where the file was written, and it will change them. It will write different patterns on top of them. The goal being that then if you go in with an undelete program and you manage to recover that information from disk, you're seeing gibberish that was written by, um, by the shred program. But it wasn't that long ago that like, people didn't really realize this. So Oliver North back in around Contra, um, he got burned by this. He deleted a bunch of files and he didn't shred them. And they were able to go back in and just undelete them basically and found evidence that he was trying to get rid of. Um, but shredding is, is pretty common now. Um, but it doesn't get you everything. So if you rewrite the contents of a file with something else, theoretically, if you recreate the pointers to that file and now you try to cat the file, you're gonna see the stuff that was written there. Unless you go down to a hardware level. Because imagine that you're, you're storing this information by, you know, polarizing little magnets so you have you know this little magnetic dipole which is north south and let's say that's a one and you overwrite that with a zero okay so let's let's just use an arrow let's say originally this was polarized pointing up and then you wrote it to a zero and now it's polarized pointing down and if I try to read this it's going to read a zero from that location but if I take that drive out of the laptop and I put it under more precise equipment, I can measure the strength of this magnetic dipole. And if this was originally pointing down and then my shredder, you know, wrote it to be pointing down, I'm going to have a very strong polarization in that direction. Whereas if it was originally pointing up and then I write a down, I'm going to have a weaker polarization in that direction. And so you can measure the strength of these dipoles and you can start to do some inference on what value was written there before it got shredded. And you can go in and you can physically look at the material and you can start to see patterns and you can look at how these dipoles are affecting neighboring areas of the platter and you can deduce history from that. And so there's all kinds of, of science, in quotes, um, on how to effectively shred documents on something like a hard drive or a flash drive or a piece of paper, right? And it's never totally straightforward. You, you know you write something on a piece of paper and then you erase it. Well, you can take a piece of paper underneath and run a pencil on it and you can figure out what was written because it left an impression. Same thing, basically, right? Everything affects everything. So there's always remnants of this stuff. Um, 
And so, so DOD, for example, had this thing called the Orange Book in the 80s. It was uh, security protocols for, um, for protecting data. And they specified how many times you had to overwrite a file with alternating patterns of ones and zeros in order for it to be considered sufficiently deleted if it was this level of classification or that level of classification and so on. And people get, get serious about this kind of stuff, right? Um, and if you're really trying to protect information, presumably it's because there's people who are really trying to access that information that you don't want to have access to. And so it's this kind of ongoing, you know, measure, countermeasure kind of thing. Um, most of which we get to not worry about because we're not doing that kind of stuff in here. <laughs> so you just delete your file and you go on and it gets overwritten at some point. But, you know, um, it's there and it's kind of good to know about. All right, so any questions, comments? This is not on the exam, but it's cool stuff to think about anyway. All right, let me um, go over one bash thing that we did not go over, but that's sometimes useful in your daily life. Um, so uh, bash script, we know we can say something like, you know, um, we can use this read command to read from standard in into uh, a variable and then we can echo it out, for example. Um, so I can read temp and it's equal to hello there. And if I redirect standard in from somewhere else, right, that read will ingest from whatever standard in is, so it reads the first line of the file, for example. Um, So sometimes it's useful to be able to read from something other than standard in inside a script. Sometimes it's really useful to be able to read from a file. So there's a way to do that with a little tweak on the read statement. Um, so we can do the following. So we can say while read temp. So read is a keyword, temp is just the name of the variable I want to have do and I'm just going to echo temp equals dollar sign temp and I'm going to say done less than and I'll put in whatever file name I want some file name and so now if I run reader Right, it'll actually ingest from that file each time that it says read temp. So it's set up as, as a while loop. All of this stuff happens until you hit end of file. Right, and then when you hit end of file, you'll kick out of the while loop. print statement on there. So that's just useful sometimes. symbolic links mm -hmm. um, when the original thing you're linking to is deleted um, is there a way to clean up the links so to 
basically be like if this points to nothing? There, um, yeah, you could. Um, You could you could write a script that would go through and look for links and see if the link exists, um, and then remove it selectively. I don't think there's a way to automatically do that, yeah. but it's definitely scriptable. So in in Bash, we didn't talk about a lot of these, but you can say something like if bracket dash e file, <coughs> then, and this code will run if that file exists. Or you could say if exclamation mark dash e to see if the file doesn't exist. And so if you try to do that on a link, I think it will do something. <laughs> if it doesn't reflect the fact that the file's deleted, there's a different version you can use that says follow links. And and link following is is a thing. Um, for example, I could try to make haha -ha to a link to haha. -ha. Right, so ha ha two points to ha ha, which points to reader, and that's totally kosher. Um, and now I've got a file called loop that points to loop. And if I try to cat that, it's going to try to find the file loop, which is going to be a pointer to loop, and it's going to notice that it chased its tail too many times, and it'll kick out. Um, so loops are possible. And so like when you, when you do the tar command to make an archive, it's possible that you have a directory, you can have directories that are links also. It's possible you might have a directory that points above the directory you started in, and tar will follow into subdirectories, right? You can say tar and it'll start in your current directory and it'll take every file in that directory or in any directory beneath it and it'll throw it all into an archive. Well, if you have a directory somewhere below your current location that points to your original location, you're gonna have a loop, right? So you can tell things like tar, do you wanna follow symbolic links or not? And more often you'd say, you know, don't follow symbolic links and then it'll avoid that. Otherwise, it will chase its tail endlessly and just make a bigger and bigger archive. So sometimes they can get you tangled up, but that's half the fun. All right, so I posted a study guide on Canvas. Um, we can talk about that tomorrow. Any questions, definitely bring them in because that's more fun than just listening to me talk. Um, but otherwise, we'll just kind of run through that tomorrow and Friday. All right, I'll see you next time.